Hi, everybody. Welcome to Tell Me Your Story. And we're welcome to Tell Me Your Story Academy, which is an imprint of Tell Me Your Story dot biz. It's a digital knowledge bank which initiates cross country, cross culture, and cross discipline learning exchange with global thought leaders. My name is Ishita Patel Kent. I'm a Gujarati in Dallas, Texas. And I am so excited that we get to talk today with the new Desi American. And I'm gonna give a chance to introduce our panelists today. So, uh, Kieran, why don't you introduce yourself? Oh, I get to introduce myself, how intimidating. <laughs> well, my name is Kieran Butt. Uh, I'm a person who is of a lot of place at once and I write and I currently live in Melbourne. All right, Rajiv? Uh, my name is Rajiv Mahabir. I'm a poet and a nonfiction writer. I uh, live in um, Malden, Massachusetts. I'm also a literary translator, and um, I teach in the creative writing program at Emerson College. And Adiba. Hi, uh, I'm Adiba Shahid Dadafdar. I, um, I live in around New York City. I used to live in New York City. Um, I, uh, I write, I translate. Um, from Urdu to English, and I'm pursuing singing right now. Great. Well, thank you all of us for joining here today. Um, this is a project in conjunction with Sambashana podcast, which is a project that Kieran and I came up with. It's a global space for writers of South Asian origin. So it's a space where we can talk about kind of all of our literary influences and things like that. And so what I, we're doing here today is talking about what it means to be busy, what it means to be American, what it means to kind of live in both of those labels at once because it's complicated for all of us. So we're gonna start with, you know, a softball question for all of you. <laughs> so all of you are writers. Who are your literary influences? I'm gonna start with Rajiv this time. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm so honored to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, when uh, you know I was approached to to participate in this conversation, I'm really I was really excited to think about the word Desi and how it relates to me and my particular community. But I'll talk about my my literary influences. Um, so I have I mean, there's so many like different streams here. I mean, there's like the musical influence, and then there's like you know the the written influence that is like not based in the United States, and then there's like the the American poetry influence, and then there's like the South Asian American poetry influence. Um, I'd say like. Like mostly, I would say Agasha Hidali is a poet who um, I adore and who I return to often. I'm also inspired greatly by uh, my former teachers, such as Nicole Cooley and Kimiko Han. Um, you know, uh, and I think, you know, uh, Indo-Caribbean poets such as Mahade Das and um, David Dabidin are also poets who I really admire and respect. Awesome. Thank you so much. Adiba? Um... I, I definitely list Aga Shahidali as amongst my greatest influences. I um, I started reading his work when I was in high school and uh, he, he seemed to me the only um, Muslim American name on our poetry syllabus. Um, I, uh, in English, I um, am particularly influenced by Allen Ginsberg's poetry. Um, yeah, so I I was reading Jack Spicer a lot, and then also um, Lorca in translation, um, and then in Urdu um, I have a whole host of influences, and I I like how Rajiv brought up um, musical influences as well because um, my musical influences are important to my writing, um, and a lot of uh, a lot of where I've heard Urdu poetry first is through song. Um, so through Iqbal Bano's compositions of Ghalib or Bezum of Bez or uh, Farida Khanam, who also sings Bez and who's also sung like Dagh de Hindi. Um, so all these poets. Um, and um, like the way they're intertwined with music, all of that kind of um, forms my universe. That's really neat. What about you, Kieran? 
Well, I'm very different from the other two panelists next to me because I am, I do write poetry on the side, but it's really like a fledgling thing. Like I'm not really a poet. And I mean, I define myself more as a fiction writer. And so for me, I'm very interested in the artists of, you know, antiquity, particularly who could take, you know, an idea concept and expand it into a giant cosmos or a world of its own. So, you know, from the beginning, I was probably inspired by Tales of the Mahabharata and because that's just, you know, I was like, I don't know if I, this speaks to the other narratives of the people here, but I, you know, would be reading much of Trikatha and, you know, that would be how I would gain a lot of my ideas of narrative. And from that, you know, I think later uh, over the course of life, different influences came to me and made me read other things. But I think I'm a big fan of a lot of modernism. I love Joyce, I love Wolf, I love Faulkner. I love people who create like big messy worlds and then kind of discombobulate narrative and then force you to stitch it back together again. And I love a lot of the great Russian realists as well, like Tolstoy, Dostoevsky and people again who create multiple worlds, we could say. That's really cool. So that's kind of where you come with your outside influences. Now let's talk a little bit about your internal influences. This is a this is a panel about identity. So I kind of want to talk about what identity means to you, to each of you. So give me a, what, when you say, think of the word identity, what comes to your brain? Like if you had to come up with three words to describe your identity, what would it be? So I'll go first, for example, I would say Gujarati, I would say Catholic, I would say book lover. Okay, book lovers, maybe two words, but you get what I mean. So what about all of you? Uh, I'll start with Aviva this time. Oh, that's so hard. Um, so I guess uh, I would say Pakistani American. Um, uh, I definitely identify, um, I would identify with the musician community. And then I also, um, I don't like um, defining myself uh, through disability, but I think uh, my um, I think being bipolar is my identity for me right now. So, yeah, that would be my third. What about you, Karen? Well, again, I think for all of us, it's you know we feel like we're just a giant pulse of energy, a steam of the moment, and then we have to like take that second and create something compressed out of it that we can share with other people. And I don't know really what I fully am in a lot of ways. I think I always ask the question, who am I, what am I? So as a result, I am one of these people who's a little bit of a moving target, but I definitely think there are three pairs of two words that I can say that do I, that, that at least have made me who I am. One is being a Canada American, a person from the US of a Canada background. Another is being a gay male, being LGBT, and another is being a world traveler. And I think all three of them have defined me not just in a sense of like, I take those identities and say like, this is what I am, exclamation point. But a lot of the things, a lot of the troubles, a lot of the struggles I've had have come from those spaces. And I had to fight a little bit to be the person I am. And all those fights deserve their own five minutes of conversation. But I think that we define ourselves by what we have to fight to be. And so I would say that those are the three spaces that I've had to struggle to become. That was really neat. I really like that answer. <laughs> um, what about you, Rajiv? Um, yeah, I think this is a this is a very complicated question, and much uh, of like what Kieran and Adiba have said, like it resonates with me. I like the idea of like uh, queerness, and I think that like I ident identify as queerness as a kind of like anti identity, um, because I think about what it means to belong to to be Indo Caribbean, to have my parents be Guyanese, to have descended from the history that I am. For me, identity means um, some like shifting labels that change. Uh, depending on where I am. So for example, in a community of South Asian people, I'll say that I'm Caribbean um, with, without having too many questions raised, or if the questions are raised and they're more nuanced sometimes, um, then like, you know, for a general white American audience who would be like, you know, oh, but you look like this. So, I mean, I feel like whenever I talk about my identity, there are all of these like real little 
quick uh, things that I use to, to kind of use it, even with religious identity, like for example, and that's something that's complicated in my family. Um, you know, we, uh, I have family that is uh, Lutheran, um, you know, uh, Hindu, Muslim. And so it's like we run Buddhist and atheist too. Like, and so we like span the gamut of like all of these different identities. So in some ways, I mean, by saying that I'm Indo-Caribbean or Guyanese is, uh, you know, that would be one of these kind of like broad, concepts it also like locates my positionality in like this kind of like post post colonial or like neo colonial reality um, living in the United States um, now that Guyana is on the brink of oil um, as well as queer which is anti identitarian in, in my kind of understanding of it and then the last thing that I'll say in terms of how I use or think about my identity is that um, uh, I'm going to leave it blank um, for that kind of like slippage of any kind of communication that I could actually try to indicate that will fall short of actually saying what or how I identify. That was, wow. That would actually read, leads very well into my next question on the list, surprisingly, which was talking about your relationship to the South Asian community as you were growing up, or in Raji's case, the Indo-Caribbean community, or the different communities that you grew up in. How did your identity kind of shift as you were going between the different in-groups that you were in? And did how effectively involved were your, you know, your parents, your grandparents, whoever you grew up with that relate you back to that South Asian community? How involved were they with the community around them? Let's start with Rajiv, since you were talking about it. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, so yeah, I grew up in Central Florida mostly, um, and when I say mostly, I was like seven when we, my family moved to Florida. Um, and I think that like where we lived, there were not many South Asians, um, and so my community of Indo-Caribbean people were family members, you know, that lived in New York and Toronto um, that we would visit very often. Um, in the neighborhood, in the neighborhoods, excuse me, in the in the school that I went to, there were like three or four South Asian families, um, and so my interaction with people who were subcontinental and Indian, Hindu, upper caste and people um, was very complicated. In that, um, anything that I would do would not be Indian enough, um, and so I, you know, I grew up with this identity of like being Indian, being told that I'm Indian in my household. However, being read by other people from the South Asia a little bit more immediately as like not being enough. And then, you know, I, I derived a lot of my linguistic and folk song kind of orientation towards my writing and my thinking of myself from my grandmother who lived in Toronto, who I was in pretty regular contact with, who we would visit for, you know, a couple of weeks a year. Um, you know, my whole entire family of five would drive in our station wagon from Orlando to Toronto every year. Um, making stops in New York City um, to visit other family members. So my sense of community had all has always been my, uh, routed through my family, um, growing up anyway, had been routed through my family and, um, you know, in these like kind of like disparate locations. Um, and to think of like, you know, actually being a whole body in one place was quite foreign to me until I grew up and moved back to New York City where I lived in uh, Jackson Heights in Queens um, and participated and became part of the the community in Richmond Hill in uh, South Queens. Fascinating. All right, what about you, Adiba? How was it for you? Um, so I, uh, I'm part of this very large family. I, um, my uh, grandparents and their siblings came to America. Like, I don't even know what decade they came in, um, but then. Um, everyone just kept coming here from Pakistan. And so basically what we have in New York right now is um, my mom and her 10 siblings and all their kids. And then my um, my grandfather's siblings and their whole uh, tribe. And then my grandmother's siblings and the, like their whole family. So, so we're just a lot of people and um, the, it was a blessing because I got to see them every weekend and um, and it was because I was around my family so much that you know I was speaking in Urdu a lot and I was 
able to understand more wholly what my identity was, um, or, or you know, at least where I came from. Um, I, what was difficult during that time though is that um, even, even my cousins um, that I used to hang out with a lot, and who obviously spoke Urdu as well, started believing it wasn't a cool thing to do to speak Urdu. And like they'd make fun of me for it, and then they'd make fun of me for like caring about the Isi culture at all, and that that really um, made me question, like you know who I was and why I, you know, what my preferences were and why they were that way, and like whether I was, you know, whether I was inferior for having for for liking Urdu for um, you know for for liking aspects of our culture, for liking Churia, for example, they, uh, I had cousins who, um, who would make fun of like the idea of Churia as being like so dangerous as uh, for being close to the wrist and just like backwards in like concept. And so just things like that, I felt like with each thing I had to be like, no, I got to, I got to like this. I got to be proud of where I come from. And so later on in life, um, Later on in life, I um, really shed that a lot. Um, like I was able to um, just really rediscover Urdu and rediscover, you know, like the traditions that I came from um, without feeling guilty about it. Because I was finally old enough to like really understand that you know, that, that was a sort of like cultural, a result of cultural dominance and cultural hegemony in, um, in the US. Yeah, uh, that was fascinating. I want to come back to a lot of the points you raised because I think we're gonna have a good conversation about that. But I do wanna hear Kieran's thoughts really quickly on his relationship to the South Asian community growing up and with his family and stuff. Well, I can kind of take a little bit from what Najib said and what uh, Adiba have said because I can relate to both parts of it. I mean, I also grew up in the South in the 90s and it was not the South it is now. I mean, back then the U.S. Uh, was not as diverse as it is now. And I think our family was a little, at least I feel that we were very alone, like a, a group of three just trying to make a waste of Georgia. And I grew up a lot in isolation. I think I also was a little bit of an isolating type. I was very introverted and I did not, I mean, I made friends, but not really. And then as I came to high school, I tried harder to meet people, but I was already so reclusive and unable to connect with people that I was not really able to create formations even at that point. So I grew up in Georgia feeling very dislocated and kind of not really a part of the community. And maybe all of us as artists have a little bit of that, but I felt it fairly strongly for probably a host of other reasons. And as that came, you know, I wanted to leave. I was really excited to go to New York and get out of Georgia. And I still have a little bit of that inside of me. I still am like kind of happy to wandered and waltzed all across the world. But um, I do think this is why I say that identity is a fight and absence is also part of how we decide who we actually are at the end of the day. Because for me, my relation to South Asian has came from an absence of connection. And then realizing later as I traveled, I started living in India and I started realizing suddenly it was so easy and effortless. Like I always had trouble interacting with like people in the US and then I'd go to India and like there was a country I barely, had, I mean, I had spent time there like visiting my family, we would go every year for a month to Mysore and Bangalore and meet people. But then I would go and I would just be able to effortlessly meet people who are like artsy types and kind of alternative. And I, I made friends so easily. And I thought, this is kind of nice. It's not as much effort here <laughs> to be like me, you know? And I liked that. I liked that it was kind of more effortless and I could just make more effortless friendships and feel that sense of a connection to a place. And um, I think also that was part of, now I can go back to what Adiba said, mother tongue, you know, that Kannada and its culture, you know, I had to fight to be a Kannada girl because people one in my mother tongue don't, even if they're born and brought up in India, don't really usually care much about their own language and very rarely speak it. But then I, having such an affinity for the language and love of it, I felt that um, it, 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 it was hard. Yeah, it was hard to position myself or localize myself fully in a quote unquote label which is why I would say that absence is a huge part of my definition towards these labels in the first place. That makes total sense. 
it's always getting away from it that makes you realize you miss it the most. So, um, what I want to talk about next is a little bit riffing off of what Adiba said, and that is that many Indian Americans feel the need to almost reject their heritage and get away from it completely and kind of Americanize themselves completely. And you got this stereotype of being, you know, the ABCD of American born confused thisy. Um, why do you think that has become such a thing? Who wants to take that one? <laughs> I think it's because of internalized racism. I think that's the easy answer. Um, I, I think it's because we're, you know, because those aspects of us are rejected, um, that we start rejecting them ourselves. Yeah, I would definitely agree with what you say, Adiba. I think at least from what I can relate, I actually hated being an Indian person growing up in the US. I actually, like when I would form my ideas of sexuality, I thought, oh, I only want to be with a white boy someday. Or, oh, I need to only partake in certain elements. I was very rejecting of my identity in, in a weird way as well, because I was also not like, I mean, there are certain elements of myself that just had to be South Asian because of what I am. But I could not handle the fact that I was this person I was always stared at. It was always seen as different. And I kind of hated the fact that I had to be different and that people always mocked me as different. But then when I grew up and I started traveling more, I realized, no, I difference is not the worst thing. And I'm going to be different in other ways. Like I also have the Westerner inside of me that then comes in with other people relate you know, to things. But I, I, I think, yeah, a lot of South Asians, it's hard, it's hard to be fundamentally at your core different and having to be born and brought up in a society that does not cater to people like you and having to live with that difference and having to deal with that difference and be defined by the difference on a daily day on a daily struggle. Yeah, for sure. Rajiv? Yeah, I mean, I think like um, what uh, both Adiva and Kiran have said are, is, yeah, it totally makes sense, this idea of um, the minoritized subject and what that does to like a consciousness, a, mi a minoritized consciousness, let's say. Uh, what does it mean then to, ha to, 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 to not be able to hide or to blend in? I mean, I feel like growing up in the 80s and 90s, um, there was so much pressure to conform, you know, when you moved to the United States, like the idea was to assimilate as quickly as possible and to like, you know, lose any accent that, um, you know, our family had at all. And so, you know, there's a, a different pressure pot um, with uh, kind of like a Caribbean identity, Caribbean Indian identity as well, uh, when it comes to Indianness is like, you know, the the, the markers of Indianness um, being read in the colonized and post-colonial space of the Caribbean um, as backward and not as um, refined as kind of like the colonial masters who had education and they had the money and, you know, with all of that came the, the ability to migrate and, the people who um, assimilated in my father's generation, <clears throat> excuse me, were people who gained, um, you know, a certain amount of uh, access. And so even to get education, people had to change their names, um, you know, to, 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 in order to be allowed entry into schools run by missionaries, by white American, Canadian, British miss missionaries. And so, um, I mean, I think it makes sense that um, that generation growing up listening to Pat Boone instead of learning their particularly folk songs, then had a generation or could have had a generation of people who wanted to kind of like, you know, distance themselves even more culturally. And I think like part of that is inherited um, and the kind of like need to understand that kind of hegemonic pressure that was, uh, you know, a lot of folks are, are forced into is something that like I grew up in that matrix of. I think though, um, you know, there's also pressure to conform to be the right kind of South Asian, um, which a lot of people in my community go against. And so, you know, they, there's like a visceral reaction to the word they see as a, a kind of way of locating like a South Asian self too. So it's like on many fronts, the kind of like, well, what do we do? You know, my own kind of uh, assimilation, my own kind of way of assimilating was, well, since I stand out, I might as well do my best to learn Hindi so that I can, um, you know, also feign a kind of South Asian identity that's easily read in a place like Florida. That makes perfect sense. That makes total sense. 
Um, so we've talked a little bit about kind of how you've dealt with your identity and dealt with your busyness. And we talked about the stereotype of being an ABCD. There are lots of busy stereotypes, especially for people who are born in the US. So what are some of the ways you do fit those busy stereotypes of, you know, I really like none, I don't know. Stupid stereotypes too. Um, and then in what ways do you completely reject those stereotypes? I mean, beyond the stereotype of being an artist instead of a doctor. Well, but I think one way that, oh, okay, that you can take it. This is a very flippant kind of thing that I'm gonna say, but I, I mean, it's, it's, it, it, it shows you a kind of, I, I think, um, sensibility. Like uh, until until I got one of those like new bidet things in the bathroom that you know works in this kind of like plug-in way, I would always have a loca in the bathroom. I do that too. <laughs> you know, it's like that's one of the things that'll never never change. I think for me. Um, but then uh, some of the things that like I uh, that I anyway, yeah, Kieran, if you'd like to go and then well, I'll... I, I I just like just said that I do that too. So I'm glad I'm not the only like Videshi Swadesh who has that habit. But um, one thing that I think was more interesting, you know, when you're born and brought up in the US, you you for whether whether you like it or not, you are part of the fabric of that culture, no matter how much you stick inside of it. And then on a subconscious level, that's what reverberates. So even if I don't necessarily like it, if I go to the US and spend time there, I do feel like this is just my natural environment, so to speak, and there's no effort. Whereas when you become a traveler and you go to other places, on a subliminal level, there is an effort. There is some space that you have to do to kind of adapt better to those spaces. And that includes India, even though I love India and I feel very close to it and I adapt fairly well to it, there are still like small things that make it clear that I was born and brought up elsewhere. And I, I notice it a lot because I live in India as well. And not right now, I live in Australia right now, but I've lived in India and I constantly live back and forth. And I notice small things. Like once I had a dinner party where I invited a lot of my friends, I invited mostly like people from India, like Indians and then be a handful of people who are like white American, Indian background from other countries, etc. And we were having a dinner party. So I was being like a good Kannadaga, like uh, <laughs> I was like, uh, I, I made like five or three different things. I made Mongal, I made like, uh, oh, what did I make? I made like Paisam and all these different things. And I was really excited to show off. And so then all my friends came, we were having fun. And then I go to my, uh, like my cooking area and I start taking the ladle and I start like taking it and serving. And um, the friends start looking at me and they're like, what are you? Are you like a village grandmother? <laughs> because whenever I constantly go back to India, I'm in a family context with older people. They're always serving me like I'm a guest coming from abroad and they're coming and they're specifically like serving me. And they're like, so I just internalize that as like a cultural thing, but the reality is like the guest has come. And so we have to act a certain way as well on top of that. So then it's like, um, when I'm with friends and we're all the same age and they're a little bit more westernized, uh, they would not just, like there would not be this, I serve and I wait for them to eat before I eat type of thing, which is again, maybe what, uh, and the other thing was because I maybe I'm a little gender queer. I'm not gender queer really, but I mean, I'm pretty cisgendered, but I don't think about the difference between male and female the way other people do. So I, uh, I, I didn't think of that as an innately female thing to do, to be like serving and waiting for people until they were ready to eat. You know what I mean? So I, they were like, why is he doing this? This is completely wrong for his age and his gender. And until that moment, I didn't realize it. So what that is, and those types of small things definitely happen when you go back. <laughs> Listen, being in a kitchen is beyond gender roles and I will die on this hill, yeah. okay? Well, I'm just trying to justify it, but I'm just telling you that people in a certain context just read these things differently. <laughs> <laughs> That's fun. What about you, Adiba? What are some of those stereotypes you happily embrace and ones you reject loudly? Um, I'm not going to talk about Lotas because I'm a lady. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just, I don't think about those things. Um, so what's it called? Um, I think, I think in terms of my art, I can speak to that in that. Um, so just in terms of like the way I write, right? Like it's very um, Urdu influenced, it's very Urdu poetry influenced. And um, so on the one, on the one hand, I am embracing Urdu in my poetry, but there's like, there's times when I'm writing 
poetry apart from that. And I feel this sort of like, it doesn't make sense, but I feel this sort of pride that I'm able to write things that are not that. Um, and also same thing with, um, same thing with singing. Um, I, I sing a lot of, um, or I'm pursuing um, the path of like singing puzzles and that's really important to me and, and that's a very um that's very basic but um in order to not like um pigeonhole myself there i also try to tell people that i'm also learning opera and like broadway singing so it's just like it's always um it's always the case that like whenever i feel like i'm really uh doing something that sort of leans into my roots i also i always have to like counter it with something um yeah otherwise it seems like not balanced or yeah that makes sense well going off of that do you feel a lot of kind of outside pressure to put your experiences as a busy person or your heritage into your work, like when you're writing or singing or doing things. And I mean, let, that goes to all of you. How do you, how does that work for you? Do you want to be known as a busy artist or do you want to be known as just someone who happens to be busy writing? Um, so I, I think both, like I, I want to be known as that, but not just that. Um, yeah, I, I want to be able to write poetry and have it be seen as poetry and not just like uh, poetry that comes from, from a Pakistani American, if that makes any sense. But also there are times when um, my identity is important to the kind of poetry that I'm writing. That makes total sense. Yeah. What about you guys, Kieran, Rajiv? Yeah, I mean, I think <laughs> I think I'm not really a person who. Uh, I mean, I believe in labels in the context of when I, as an individual, have to face the world. But as an artist, I don't think I'm responsible for labels. I have my ideas of what I want to make, and I have my ideas of what role they'll play in literature. But I don't label them in. Uh, either as a person of South Asian heritage, either as a person from the US, either as an LGBT person. I don't I don't like to label my work uh, and I don't think my work is meant to be labeled. Um, yeah, thank you for this question and thank you for your responses, both Adiva and Kieran. I think that like, it's impossible not for, for me and the speakers in my poems and in S my essays to not stand at an intersection of identities and whether or not that's like my intention um, for that to happen. I mean, a part of it is like, well, I didn't intend on this, uh, you know, glory, like unique and marvelous life, right? I mean, this was a gift. And I think that, um, you know, so often in the academy, we are pigeonholed into what the capitalists want us are, and our work to, to be and how they want us to participate in the, the world of American literary arts, like for example, I mean, that's based on my current context. Um, and, you know, if it is anti good immigrant, bad immigrant, then I'm all for the political project of that. Um, and I don't think that, um, you know, you know, I don't think that my identity, like, you know, as being South Asian is reducible, meaning like, oh, you are just writing South Asian poetry. I mean, I think that's also like a flaw in the, in the idea of the American Academy. Um, a, a dear friend of mine is on faculty at University of Puget Sound in um, Seattle. Um, she's an ethnomusicologist, her name is Amira Nimji, Dr. Amira, Amira Nimji. And we had this co conversation because she's a Kathak dancer and um, you know, trained in, um, <clears throat> in uh, Toronto as, as well as Bangalore. And um, she's like, you know, will I ever be seen as a cultural creative, as a practitioner of Kathak? Or am I only going to be the bearer of cultural knowledge? And I think that like um, the kind of work that she does, like pushes that boundary. And it's been really engaging for me to think about like how other art pra arts practitioners like come to this kind of thing. I mean, like, we, we have lineages and we have trajectories for our art and what influences us. And I think that like um, what she is saying really kind of articulates the, the, this new kind of feeling 
um, that I'm having, um, especially thinking about who has access and why they have access. And, you know, the fact that the publishing world in the United States is still 90% white, and that does not reflect the actual diversity of the country. And so I think that, um, you know, it's always upon, why is it on my back then to kind of like, uh, you know, decide on labels when um, it's actually the people in power who need to actually challenge you know, what they say and how pigeonholing works and that kind of thing. I mean, I don't mean to be like so backwards answering the question, but like, do I feel the pressure? It's like, I felt embarrassed by it before. I remember going to readings in, um, when I was an MFA student, I went to a reading at KGB bar and there was another South Asian woman in the audience who, um, as I went up to read, they, they announced that I was like a public school teacher. And she said, I bet he's not very good. Like as I'm getting up to read, and I was like, oh, like, that's funny because like one, you're reading like this, you're reading me as South Asian and you're also a poet. And like, you have this like feeling of what South Asian writers can do, but then also like being a teacher in a public school also meant that I didn't have that kind of thing that the writer should have. And so, you know, that's kind of how I think about the pressures of identity. Yeah, there's definitely a lot coming with the publishing industry doing a lot of you know putting pressure on for almost the pigeonholing themselves of the stories where they're the ones asking for writers of all minority backgrounds they're asking for them to do their own their own own voices work and things like that so it's this weird in between place that the writers have to live in where you don't do it, you don't get the representation, but if you do do it, you get kind of pigeonholed. So what do you think is going to be the best ways to put pressure on the industry to get out of that cycle? I'm giving up on the industry, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> I respect it for what it is. It exists as its own cog in the capitalist machine and I will never fit it. <laughs> I will just have to create my own publishing endeavor, endeavors and hope for the best because I, I mean, unless you want to write a very specific thing that they want, I mean, I'm not trying to say that people who aren't talented get published. A lot of people who get talented are very published, but it has so much to do with how much their work aligns with what is salable and what the industry wants. And it's, it's not changing overnight and probably won't change in the course of my literary career. So, and I don't have the patience for it. I mean, one thing that we also realize is once you leave the US, how unimportant a lot of these things are. Like, you know, just a small thing. Like I was in a class and, you know, someone asked about my day and I just started like, um, you know, I had a good day because I had some acceptance from some literary journals and some pretty big ones. So I was like, oh, I got accepted by X, Y, Z. And none of them, and they're publishing students, but in Australia, and none of them knew the names. They didn't understand it. And they're like relatively big magazines in the US, but no one in Australia even can, write. like, like, it's like, I don't know, like, it's a, it's a world, you know, and it, it, it's important in, to some extent, but you have to ultimately just speak and create work and write and do your best to try to do what you believe you're meant to do regardless of how the outside world validates you. And that includes publishing work. So we've got Karen on the anti-publishing world mm -hmm. screen. Got it. <laughs> Rajiv, Adiba, what are your thoughts on reforming publishing or walking away from it? Well, I think there's a we're in the middle of a kind of uprising, <laughs> and <laughs> definitely in the poetry world, and I'm excited for that. Um, part of my answer to this is to then, you know, also become an editor myself. Um, and so, like, you know, I edit the translations um, in a translation section in Waxwing Journal, and part of that, you know, the the, the publication is quite fabulous. Um, started by some um, really wonderful and dear people. Um, Aaron Stalkup, Justin Bigos, um, Louis Bojan, um, and um, uh, W. Todd Kaneko, um, you know, these who started this journal that is really into the fabric of that kind of literary publishing. Diversity is front and center, and it's not just lip service. Um, and I think that, like, uh, well, that's one of the ways that I can that I I, I see my work, um, you know, doing that. Um, another way um, that I see this happening for me personally is my insistence. Like I will keep on writing and I will keep on publishing in the United States. Um, part of that is about a platform for other uh, Indo-Caribbean people publishing in the United States because, you know, who am I looking to that was published in the United States? You know, I mean, uh, there's not very many of us. Um, and I think that like, 
if we can, you know, form these constellations of, you know, what success can and can't look like, um, and really troubling that kind of issue about, oh, well, this is not this, this doesn't fit very neatly into this. I think part of that also is the conversation of the press that you're involved with and how um, that works. Oh no, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, we hear you. Okay, because <laughs> like all of a sudden my video went away. And so like I've been, I've been lucky in this, uh, you know, in this whole industry to be with some presses who have really championed my work, like Four Away Books, like Tupelo Press, like Kaya Press. And, you know, I think that, um, that, that feels good. And so I'm not willing to just kind of, um, you know, throw away the, the, the whole publishing game because I think it's also that weird kind of game when my real work is actually writing the poems. Um, I don't know if you all all have been following or we're, we're following over, was that summer? Oh my goodness. What's time these days? But um, the hashtag publishing paid me on Twitter. Um, where you see, like, you know, even when people of color get published in these big kind of places, they are they are paid pennies to the dollars that white folks, white women, white men, white queers are paid. Where you see people with debut novels for you know upwards of seventy five thousand dollars, where you know an Asian American well respected novelist got six thousand dollars for his debut novel which beat the pence off of some of those other, like, in my, in my oh, opinion. American dirt, cough. Well, and then, you know, and then the, the whole issue of representation, who gets to say what? So I think it's like, it takes the tenacity and it takes the insistence. And that's, I, I mean, and I think like, I'm fairly committed to that. Yeah. And Aliva? Um, so I think part of it is just continuing to write and continue. I, you know, I feel like as long as I don't pigeonhole myself, I can continue the work of not allowing others to pigeonhole me. And then um, the other thing is I, I really think supporting um, like my colleagues when they have work out uh, is really important for me because that way I'm like in my response to, um, to their work, I, you know, I'm approaching it a certain way. And therefore, um, like, if I approach it in a way that doesn't pigeonhole them, that like, you know, that, um, <laughs> that like, um, gives, uh, appreciates their work for what it is, then, you know, I'm setting the precedent, even if it's just one person, like I'm, I, I'm trying to get those around me to do the same thing. That's really neat. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, the Desi community has always been more of a community where we are have each other's back. So it's something that I like to see that we've kept up as we've moved on and kept going through generations. So what do you think it is about this generation of authors of the heritage that we are the ones pushing it and pushing the envelope and refusing to kind of accept that we have to stick to those tired ABCD style narratives almost, that we don't have to just write about, oh, these are my troubles as an immigrant in America. I, so thank you. Thank you for this question. And this is something that I've been thinking about a lot personally, actually. Um, but I think that part of this is that when I look at the people who have influenced me a lot, you know, like from a different generation or like writing a generation, writing before me, Kazim Ali, Mina Alexander, Aga Shahid Ali, um, <clears throat> these are all people who actually have been troubling that line, um, you know, and pushing for representation and pushing the envelope of what's possible for immigrant narratives and the diversity of narr narratives, um, you know, whether it's like, uh, you know, the poetics of displacement or exile or even like the politics of and aesthetics of sound. Um, I think that this important work has been done or is, is, is being done. And I think that we are in this generation now enabled to continue the work of pushing those boundaries by those people who have come before us and who have actually fiercely fought for representation and also space at the at the table. I mean, that's a, a problematic metaphor for sure. But um, yeah, and I think like that's kind of, you know, we we have 
inherited this kind of revolutionary spirit, I think, from those people who come with it. Definitely. It's, you know, it's been an interesting mix to see, you know, who's come out and we've had some of those stories, but we've definitely had the fighters and we're definitely building on what they've come out with. So what about you guys? What are some of the things that you think we're able to take away from earlier generations of the authors and build off of and some things that we're kind of able to push away? So I talked about Al Shahid Ali earlier, and I think one thing that I could, that I really appreciated about his work um, was its lack of apology. Like you know, he was um, he was here, and he was, um, you know, he he's the one who um, you know taught me that you could quote Ghadim in a quote. I mean, in a poem, and you know, most people wouldn't understand what it was, but those who knew would know um or you know like bringing the vessel here and like trying to explain to people how it worked and you know not not really uh just being sort of firm in the way you know uh just how he delineated it like you know not anything can be, you can't just call anything a vessel it has rules so just this sort of like you know, um, this uh, this lack of hesitation when it came to taking up space, I think that was really important for me to witness um, in that generation. Well, I would say that, first of all, we can never forget uh, where we come from in all senses of the words, be it nations or family, and of course, the writers who were before, like even someone like Jumba Lahiri, who some of us will read and not fully relate to because we come from a different wave of immigration, we still have to be grateful for people like that who can kind of allow for there to be a space at all for Indian origin people in an American context, right? But I do think that in 2020, we live in a more globalized world. We live in a time where like the ideas of what it means to be of a nation as a whole is changing and people are not fully like belonging to any country really. So I think that as, you know, and, and this is something I was telling Ishita as well, I think that even the concept of Daisy American is fascinating because it has so many other strands to it that cannot be easily like categorized in the way that we would have categorized more historic identities, like say, like to be a black American, there are certain formations that happen over the course of many years and centuries that caused a certain group to kind of stick together and call themselves something. Whereas within an Indian American context or a Pakistani American context or a Guyanese American context, first of all, first of all, all of those are very different. And then even inside of just one of those, each person would have a different narrative. And so I think that each person therefore becomes a different narrative. Each person also would have a different relation to how much time they spent in one country, how much time they spent in another. And that disseminates the idea of immigration. It becomes that more that at each moment, at every given second, we have to relate to a certain national narrative or a narrative of place. And as a result, that creates another way for us to even write the meaning of place and location and gods themselves. So I think that as a result, to be part of the Daisy American narrative now is to say that we're part of these like shifting targets and we belong to kind of the narrative of the moment, which is one of kind of a global narrative coming up. And then what do you think you want to see the Daisy American narrative become as we go forward, as we keep moving forward, as we do that whole, like, I'll start with Gearin, because as you see the globalization going and as community as technology improves communications across the world as you know translations bounce from country to country as people travel well not right now but more <laughs> hopefully five years will be hopefully, traveling again. hopefully again once you know we're not in the midst of a pandemic yeah i hope so <laughs> i really hope so but anyways i think that yeah that's absolutely i don't want to hope for anything because i think that you know we cannot historicize the moment because we will try to say like you know because again as the quote unquote daisy american narrative is now forming there'll be this pressure to kind of like historicize it in the way that we historicize other narratives but we're in the moment and we live 
in response to the moment, right? So we do not really know how in 50 years people are going to talk about us at all. So I think the better thing is just not to give a narrative, just to respect that we're all like part of a moment where narrative itself is changing and that we are becoming, like for example, as virtual reality improves, we'll start like, you know, zooming into worlds that we create like real physical places into an immediate environment that as like we become like more crisscrossed more travels we'll be living in multiple places at once like the idea of what and how we will relate to land is going to change in the next 50 years in the first place so i would just want to encourage any person who wants to use this rubric as a space to claim an identity to be a part of us you know not necessarily a, a narrative but be part of a community to be part of a space where people who belong to a similar bracket can kind of approve of that, like, like appreciate and support and give those people something back, you know, but I don't think that we should say X, Y, Z person should be like this or that. Definitely. What about you, Adiba? What do you see kind of, what are some of your goals, at least for the future of the Desi American literary community? I guess we were talking about um, being pigeonholed and feeling like we need to perform an identity or um, reject an identity. And I, I would hope for <laughs> some greater ease there <laughs> um, in the future. I, I would hope that, you know, there isn't as much tension, there isn't as much as um, I feel like um, a lot of us are um, at, at least me um, I'm I'm a daughter of immigrants but I'm also an immigrant myself I um, uh, I came to New York when I was two months old so we're relatively new here and so I would I would hope that as time passes like you know, future generations start feeling a greater sense of home, you know, um, both both in like their approach to um, like America and the American literary scene, but also in um, like America and the American literary scene approach to them. Um, yeah, that's just what I hope for. That's sweet, yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's great. And I, if I can jump in and like kind of build on um, what Adiba said because I, that really resonates with me. Um, I, I um, I'm disappearing. Oh, no. Yes. Can you hear me oh. <laughs> great. Well, uh, basically, I'm hoping for like you know the the potential for this to have political dimension as well for it to be anti anti Hindutva you know, anti-collapsing the diversity of Desi communities, you know, with space made for um, Dalit voices as well. Um, you know, and I'm hoping that it's also the Desi American poetic um, can also be aware of our own complicity in settler colonial violence um, and anti-Black racism and that, you know, we ally ourselves uh, uh, in the literary world and in the world, uh, more broadly speaking, in the trenches with Black activists who are fighting um, for their survival right now against uh, this kind of tyrannical government. Um, and that's kind of like the hope that I have for, you know, this, the next, what's, gonna, what's going to come, um, you know, as, you know, we, we have these immigrant and recent immigrant voices, um, you know, that are now making homes for ourselves in the States that already has a, um, a, a kind of racialized makeup that we are able to mobilize our identities um, in these ways to form alliances, um, become accomplices. Wow, oh, that's awesome. And yeah, I definitely agree. I would love to see that kind of collaboration with other communities of color. So as a kind of final thought process and wrap up here, this entire talk is called the New Desi American. and. The word Desi, it's, you know, somebody of South Asian origin, Bengali, Pakistani, Indian, somebody who identifies with this, this as home. What is your relationship to viewing India as home or Pakistan or, and how does that affect who you are?
Well, I'm someone who actively lives in India, and not right now, but now that the world has shrunk, I have to be stuck in Melbourne. I'm someone who wants to live in Mumbai and I'm planning to move back there and make that my base of writing. So, I mean, for me, it's very much still very much in the present. I don't really live in one country or the other. So I'm kind of coming at this from a different perspective, but yeah, I think uh, ultimately I, I don't know. I mean, I, I guess I don't think, I guess because I'm not in the U S reflecting on it, but I'm more like in between literally physically in between, it's more like in the moment for me. So I don't relate to it as much if you know what I mean, because I also am going back and like having friends there and dealing with it. So it's not like a reminiscent state, but uh, anyways, yes, <laughs> maybe someone else will have a better answer. Yeah. <laughs> so I was discussing the concept of home a while ago with friends and I thought about home as um, existing in memory and for me with Pakistan the only relationship I really have with it is memories of it and so um, yeah uh, it it's interesting because present day Pakistan I, I don't really I haven't been in a very long time. I don't really follow its politics. I don't follow <laughs> cricket. Um, I, I just don't know anything about it. And all I know is this sort of attachment I had before that perseveres. But it, it doesn't seem to be very um, palpable. It doesn't seem to be extremely real, if that makes any sense. Yeah, for me, I think um, <clears throat> India is some place that I've lived a couple of years. You know, I don't have an active situation there, um, you know, in South Asia, like an active familial situation. And I do have very dear friends who, you know, uh, are, are, are very close to me. Um, and it's been a while since I've been back. But India has always in my family lived in kind of our creation story of where we're from in a way that was mythological. Um, and I think that like my relationship to India will be that, um, you know, the land of the ancestors. And I think that like going back all this book is a good spiritual um, uh, thing for me in that it is connection to uh, the once upon a time that um, I grew up knowing. That's really neat. Well, let's see. If anybody in the audience that's watching has any questions, we can ask them at this time. I'd love to hear, we'd all love to hear from you. So while we're waiting for that, any final thoughts from anyone on this evening, Americanness, writing, words of wisdom? I think out of all of us, Adiba is probably the wisest. <laughs> I don't even. <laughs> Unfortunately, I, I wish I could be more alive than I am right now. Oh, don't say that. You're alive enough. <laughs> as long as you're breathing in and out, you are living enough. Exactly. See, fire. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So well, are you questions? Uh, no. oh, I'm out of questions. So we're gonna, let me ask all of you one last thing, though. Where can people find you and follow your work on Twitter, Instagram, email lists, whatever? Um, should we put it in the chat? or You can say it out loud, and then we'll make sure we get it in the... Um, my Twitter handle is embarrassing but it's at adibalu a-d-e-e-b-a-l-o-o -O. It's, it's a nickname that my um uh aunts and uncles gave me when i was three <laughs> okay but that's like the most busy thing ever doesn't everybody have their own like aunt and uncle nickname yeah but then their sister doesn't turn it into their twitter handle <laughs> fair enough <laughs> <clears throat> Rajiv, where can people find you on the internet? Yeah, I'm on all of this, well, all of the social media. I don't even know what that means anymore. But basically, like Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, at Rajiv Mohabir. And um, also, RajivMohabir.com, you can find my website. 
Kieran? Uh, well, yeah, if you put in Kiran, but you will find me pretty much any. I mean, I don't know. There could be some other one, but anyway, <laughs> if you just search that somewhere on these social media handles, you at least have seen my face. So I think it should be fairly easy to find me if you're interested in finding me. <laughs> so there it is. Very good. And thank you again to tell me your story for hosting us tonight for the New DC American. We really appreciate it. Thank you guys all for coming and watching us and we hope you have a wonderful evening, morning, afternoon, wherever you are. Bye-bye. Have a good day, everyone. Or good night for most of you because I am at 1.30 <laughs> of the day. Thank you all so much for this wonderful talk and thank you for those of you who are uh, watching and listening. Thank you for having us. We appreciate